everyone, and welcome to the Sydney St. James Show. In episode eight, we're going to be discussing the making of the second novel in the Storm Lord trilogy series, a novel called Nine Months Will Tell. But before we do, I need to turn back the hands of time, maybe a few years or heck, I I guess more than a few years, maybe a few decades, uh, at the beginning of my writing career. First, I never thought about writing other genres for over 10 years. As a matter of fact, my first dozen novels or books were basically dealing with local history. One was called The History of Eagle Lake High School. Others were called The Smith History. Others were called whatever they were called, but there were 12 of them. And my last one was one called First 100 Years of the Presbyterian Church in Eagle Lake. Then my hobby became genealogy and I became a professional genealogist. I helped dozens of people with their family history. I had podcasts. I had websites everything associated with genealogy. I even wrote wrote software programs that dealt with genealogy. And this is before the invention of the grand internet. So my career basically dealt with family history, and I knew how to put together thousands upon thousands of pieces to a puzzle to actually find the entire family history. I began all this work at a library in Houston, Texas. It was known as Clayton's Genealogy Library. Then, out of the blue, maybe eight, ten years ago, I was offered $30,000 to produce a family history book by a family in Denver. I had just finished an 800-page book on the Smith family history. And... That was more almost like a local family history because it was my wife's side of the family and I expanded it and expanded it and everything that was to be known by everyone in the book was written out. And I have to admit, (laughs) it took me hours upon hours in writing that book. As a matter of fact, it was two years, plus or minus 10 hours a day That equates to $4.10 an hour. But it wasn't the money. I had a lot of fun doing the Smith family history. and But it didn't really make any money. So after I did that particular one, I did another two-volume set for the Eagle Lake High School. And it was called Eagle Lake High School, 1885 to 1972. The same thing happened with that novel. Only a limited amount of copies were sold and only to the people who were interested in Eagle Lake High School. Well, that's where change happened. And the change occurred when I took a book that I wrote back at Texas A&M in the 1970s and brought it to light, brought it to the front and wrote that first novel in the Faith Chronicles. And in my first seven episodes, I talked about the making of all of those novels in that historical or creative historical nonfiction genre. Again, history is important, but one day uh, I changed my mind, and I don't know if it was on the anniversary of Abraham Lincoln getting shot or what it was, but something got my interest into looking at Abraham Lincoln. And when I did... I don't even remember this in my history classes at A&M or anywhere else. And I'm I'm sure they probably taught this to me. And I'm sure that uh, the professor would not have left this out. But for whatever reason, it didn't cling in my memory. And that was there were several people, along with John Wilkes Booth, who was part of the overall conspiracy to assassinate Abraham Lincoln. So I became very interested in that. So what I ended up doing was, in the public domain, was the entire court transcript 
of the trial of the suspected killers or conspirators, whatever you might want to call it. The, the entire trial transcript was laying in front of me because I printed the whole thing out. I started going through it and noticed there were several people involved in the plan to kill Abraham Lincoln. So, again, in the creative historical nonfiction, I broke all the people that went to court to be tried for that assassination into their own personal separate novel. So we expand. Now, how do I expand? With the techniques I learned in genealogy, I found out who they were. I went to their towns. I found out information on them, uh, where their parents were born and raised and where they were buried, what cemeteries. I started to put all the pieces together so I could build each one of those characters. Then, when I wrote the book, and this is one of those six in the Abraham Lincoln assassination series called Mary Elizabeth Sherratt. On one of the anniversaries of the assassination of Abraham Lincoln, a book, another book was released and books will stand a hundred feet high on top of one another that's written about the Lincoln assassination. So my book is just one of thousands probably, <laughs> but I found out that a lot of people, she was hung, by the way, Mary Elizabeth Surratt, and she was hung because she was part of this conspiracy. Well, that really got fuel for thought for me. So when I wrote those books, and particularly Mary Elizabeth Surratt, my intention was to let my readers read the book in a creative historical nonfiction sort of way and make their own determination. Was she guilty or was she not? And I won't talk too much more about that. You'll just have to read the book or the whole series and get an idea of what I'm talking about. So anyhow, after I finished those six novels, uh, my daughter wrote uh, uh, an erotica romance. Of course, I didn't know much about erotica romance. I thought romance was romance. <laughs> but so I kind of wanted to change the genre that I wrote in. So I read the first chapter. I looked over at my wife and I said, Ooh, man, that's a steamy novel, honey. And she looked at me and she said, what page are you on? Uh, page 18. And she started laughing. <laughs> she, she started laughing and said, wait a minute. You read the first 18 pages of the book and you're ready to put it down because it's too steamy. Um, I think you need to put it down because the first 18 pages aren't steamy. It's the last 225. But so anyhow, I decided I was going to write a romance novel. And in that romance novel, I wanted it to be romance, but maybe, I don't know how you put it, uh, Maybe romance with a gentle touch. Maybe romance with style, um, classy, but not too descriptive, but not too non-descriptive. So the Stormlord trilogy, in which you heard in the last episode, um, in the Flaming Blue Sword, that has some pretty steamy romance in it, I have to admit. At least I think it's steamy. <laughs> but then the second novel continues that series. And I'd like to kind of start off by the making of this novel by saying what basically was one of the first paragraphs as we continue in to novel two from the novel. Though the sunset was illuminating the horizon, the pathway through the tall woods behind the cottage was still dark. The tall aspen stood as if charcoal against the deep blue skies from the setting sun. The only color left was the orange pouring across the skyline to the west over the Pacific Ocean. Angel slung the large flaming blue sword over her shoulder and walked, not looking at the danger ahead, only at the rain-sodden path along the cliff, treacherous 
with slippery mud. My continuation now of the Storm Lord trilogy in chapter two, a book two, nine months will tell, finds our character Angelica Thompson and Sheriff Kevin Connors expecting their first child. Her pregnancy comes as a surprise to her and Kevin because it is precisely nine months after their defeat of Ethan Knight in Chapter 1 of the Storm Lord Trilogy series. The question now that arises for the two lovebirds is whether the Storm Lord lost his life in their final battle in the first of the series, or did he somehow miraculously survive the epic encounter? Throughout the book, significant events taking place appear to threaten the life of Angel's first child. Was she too old, past the age of 39, to, to give birth? She wondered if it, if it was just her age. Was there a problem with her child? Angel doesn't want to know if it's a boy or a girl. She's ready to have the child naturally and gets closer to her full term, but wonders if that will be such a good idea. The expecting mother lives with pain after pain, day in and day out. She experiences dreams that are, once again, so real she can never get more than an hour or two each night of sleep. Angels appear in her dreams. Demons appear in her dreams. And death appears in her dreams. Have you heard about Anchor.fm by Spotify? It's the easiest way to make a podcast with everything you need all in one place. Yep, Anchor has the tools that will allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or your computer. And best of all, Anchor is totally free. Download the Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. It was in the last two weeks of her pregnancy, she realized her child's life was threatened by outside forces. Has the Storm Lord returned to her dreams? But, but wait, is he real? Who did she and Kevin kill in their first encounter, if it wasn't the Storm Lord. In the first book, Angel and Kevin began their life together, just like any storybook fable. Kevin's the knight in shining armor who she meets and who protects her and comes to her rescue when the Storm Lord threatens to take her life. She's beautiful, long flowing auburn hair, that crowned her head to the middle of her back. What can we say about Kevin? Well, he's handsome and a courageous divorced sheriff of Black Rock Cove. As in all fables, these two are made for each other. But will they stay together when Kevin finds out the real truth about Angel? Unfortunately, their lives are far from being made perfect, become complicated. So that's basically what the book is about, book two, and the making of the book. And as I always do, I always like to go into the book somewhere and pick out a small little snippet to play for you and let you kind of hear the how exciting it can be or how dramatic it can be, or whatever it could be. So, without further delay, a snippet from Nine Months Will Tell. Boom! The concussion from the blast knocked Angel down to the ground. She shook her head and a moment to gain her composure. An enormous explosion had occurred at the fertilizer plant less than a block away from where Angel was standing. 
It was so large, the concussion that knocked Angel down found her dizzily making it back up to her feet. She shook her head a few times, pushed herself back up, still not believing what in the hell just happened. She glanced back at the large building. It was as though a fist of orange flame had decided to punch its way out of the top of the roof. Windows shattered. Smoke and fire rushed out of every nook and cranny it could find. Thousands of pieces of glass and steel. A deadly rainfall showered down all around the downtown square. Car alarms wailed chaotically up and down the street. The situation was absolutely total chaos. A huge tree stood in the center of town square, one that Angel had sat under during early fall to read a novel. She can't help but remember with her arms outstretched that she would never be able to reach a fraction of the way around that gnarly bark trunk. The roots had pushed up the concrete sidewalk, breaking it in many places surrounding the area. Buildings were all aflame, all around the square. Then, without any warning, while continuing to search for Kevin, she stopped, squinted her eyes in the direction of that tree, and said, No! No! Oh, for God's sake, don't let this be happening. Dread owned Angel. It pushed against her like an invisible gale. Her vision and fear had her stomach locked up tight. Her face was set like rigor mortis. Her teeth locked tightly together. The inferno had spread everywhere, making Everywhere one looked as though the entire earth itself was burning and sucking in all the oxygen it could feed its flames. Two women came running in her direction, screaming, ablaze while several others were losing consciousness and falling to the ground trying to fight the giant tongues of the flames, which licked and licked and licked up from the ground. Angel wrapped a scarf around her face to block the smoke. She knew this. She knew she should run. The blaze was all around her. All avenues of escape appeared out of the question. Besides, she must find Kevin. She turned her attention back to the tree, the only tree in town that was not ablaze. She again paused before running to its solitude and stood frozen, gazing at all directions of the fiery inferno, completing its awful sweep through the buildings in Black Rock Cove. Angel, what are you doing, child? Run! Run! You must get away from here now! Angel heard her mother's voice behind her. Her brain was in overdrive and her concentration totally shot. She scurried in the direction of the tree, people screaming everywhere, shouting and running past her. Her focus was on finding Kevin and not worried one bit about her own life. She didn't respond as something else called her attention near the tree. Come, child, Laura said, putting her arm around her to guide her from the scene. We really must hurry. Come. Angel stopped and glanced at her mother's ashen face and then backs once more to the tree. The smoke swirled for a moment and headed straight to the sky, clearing the area momentarily where Angel could see better. Ethan, she peered around in all directions. I know it's you. Get out of my head. I will not let you win. Be gone, you evil son of a bitch. She threw her words at him as though they were stones. Then, no sooner had she confronted Ethan in her dream, and without any further warning, a terrible sight was unfolding. Angel and her mother froze in their steps. 
totally taken back from what they saw. Tied to the huge tree, in the center of the square were several of the villagers. Angel continued to gaze in awe. No, mother, it's... No, Kevin! Kevin! Angel screamed, but he nor the others couldn't hear her over the loud roar of the flames from the burnt and blackened supports, making the buildings appear like skeletons. Angel <coughs> continued <coughs> to cough. Smoke filled her lungs. She got closer. Kevin recognized her. Run, Angel. Run. Get out of here. <coughs> Save yourself. His voice sounded like the words were formed with smoke. His lungs were charred. Angel looked around quickly. All appeared to be a blur. No traffic lights had power and showed no signs of life. No cars were coming, turning from one street to another. There were no signs of any fire trucks. No, Kevin, no. Angel screamed and cried until she sank exhausted to the asphalt pavement. Everything surrounding her appeared like something out of a horror movie. All the street lights were aflame with charred wooden posts still holding them upright. Angel, up on her knees, was frozen, unable to believe what her senses were telling her. She was overwhelmed by the smoke. All she wanted was Kevin's comfort, his strong arms, and his reassuring words. So, without any hesitation, the stranger walked over with his torch and set the people on fire, one by one. Angel bit down on her lip, trying not to let Ethan fuel her fear and to try and not to burst into tears. She was so close to giving up, but realized Ethan was raising the level of his evil each time he entered her dreams. Hysterical cries came from the villagers. The screaming sobs were only interrupted by the person's need to draw a breath. She could see Kevin. He was engulfed by the swirling inferno. An angel was speechless. Her sadness was hollowness. She floundered in an agonizing maelstrom. The smoke had consumed her lungs. The baby was kicking, trying to survive the loss of oxygen. Angel placed both the palms of her hands on the ground and stared at her fingertips. Her hollowness was a shell, holding in a thousand oceans of tears. The stranger was joined by numerous others, obscured by the flames, cheering and laughing. They were enjoying the moment. Angel could do nothing but stand there. The sight was unbearable. She lowered her head and could no longer watch. She sank further down to her knees. The sight so horrendous, her brain refused to comprehend. Oh, God. God, why, why? Her hysterical crying and screaming sobs were only interrupted by her need to draw a breath. <sighs> After a moment of being lost in terror, she turned to hold her mother. Her screaming sobs choked by her need to gain a lungful of air filled with smoke. So much pain. Mother, mother. Angel spun in all directions, but her mother had disappeared. Mother, mom. No response came. She couldn't bear to look at Kevin. He laid on the ground, smoldering. She could smell the burning flesh. The sadness the pain comes close to the surface of her skin, and her empathy was triggered. Angel couldn't choose to walk away, or she would surely get a kick of guilt as punishment. So, 
Angel gasped for air again. She couldn't get up. The tugging on her soul by Ethan and his foul deeds wore on her. She laid in pain. She could feel him pulsing in her mind, trying to pull her soul into his deadly trap. Her mind's thoughts rambled. Oh, God. God, please help me. Is this how I will find my end? Is this how others before me have found theirs? She found it difficult to hold back her emotional collapse. Ethan's words found a place in Angel's nighttime. <laughs> oh, lassie, he paused a moment while he began to laugh. You can't imagine how bad I want to take your life right now. But someone else wants that job even more than me. Angel was more confused than ever. She tried to look around in all directions, but her insides hurt from the baby kicking, almost ready to get out. And she said to herself, Is there someone else nearby? Why haven't they already done their foul deed? She lifted her head and glanced about the entire area, both of her arms around the baby, trying to comfort her from pain. Her vision was blurred, but she saw a tall man with a black cloak disappearing into the thickened smoke. Well, that's another episode. <laughs> You'll have to get the book if you want to see what happens after that. Um, but anyhow, that's the making of the second book in the Storm Lord trilogy series. Um, it's called Nine Months Will Tell. And in our next episode will be the conclusion of the Storm Lord trilogy series. And it's like 400 pages. And it's probably the most exciting conclusion of any of my books written so far. You don't want to miss it. The making, the three keys to Armageddon. Till we meet again from Sydney St. James. Happy listening.